Hey there everybody, Mr. Marek here. In this video, we are going to discuss some of the basic ideas behind how we treat matter, which you may also refer to just as stuff, in physics. Um, and it kind of differs a little bit from how you may have treated stuff in chemistry. Um, the first basic idea of um, how we treat things in physics is that of an object. So when we say object, the according to Hoyle definition, is a collection of particles. When you think of particles, you may think of atoms and molecules and ions and all those things, in which the interaction between those things are not important. So here's a good example. If in physics class we are studying the motion of a baseball, like for instance we hit a baseball with a bat, we want to know how far away it's going to land, if we don't need to um, worry about what it's made out of, then we're going to treat it as an object. However, if we're doing something different with the baseball, like we're going to try to dissolve it in acid, for example, then we do need to worry about what it's made out of, and we can't just treat it like an object. In that case, we would treat it as a system. We'll come back and define that term here in just a few minutes. So when we think of things as being objects, basically we're acting as if they don't have any internal structure, like it's just one solid point in space. So when we represent objects, typically we represent them as just circles or squares or rectangles or something like that. We don't worry about the fact that whatever this is is made up of a bunch of other different things that are all interacting with each other. We just treat it like one solid thing that has no internal structure. So key thing to remember, objects don't have any internal structure. In chemistry, you probably learned about the three fundamental particles that form atoms. Remember that an atom is the smallest unit of matter that has the properties of a particular chemical element. Once you divide up an atom into smaller things, then it no longer has the properties that it did before. So for example, chlorine has, a specific, has specific properties. Once you take something, a sample of chlorine and divide it into things smaller than the individual atom, then it no longer acts like chlorine normally acts. Remember that these atoms are made out of three different particles called protons, neutrons, and electrons, which in chemistry you probably learned are fundamental particles, as in they can't be divided up into anything smaller. Well, that's not entirely true because protons and neutrons are made out of smaller pieces called quarks, but in most situations we're going to deal with, that's not ever going to happen. And so we can kind of consider protons and neutrons to be fundamental as well. So depending on the situation again, we may treat something as small and tiny as an individual atom as either an object or a system. And in chemistry, and you probably didn't realize this, um, you switched back and forth between atoms being an object versus atoms being a system. In physics, it's going to be important that we define the difference between when we're treating something as an uh, object versus when we're treating it as a system. So let's talk about some properties of objects. These are really, really important fundamental properties that all things have. The first property we're going to refer to as mass. And there's two kinds of mass, the first being what's called inertial mass. Inertial mass is the property of objects to resist changes in their motion. Basically, you can think of it as the measurement of how hard it is to push or pull something and make its motion change. We measure this in a unit called kilograms. Symbol is little k, little g. And the way we might symbolize this quantity is with an m, and then we may give it a subscript i for inertial. In chemistry, you probably use grams instead of kilograms. We use kilograms in physics because it's a more convenient size mass relative to the objects that we're typically studying. So for example, if we're talking about an object as big as a car, it's more convenient to express its mass in kilograms than in grams. The second kind of mass is referred to as gravitational mass. This is the mass that causes objects to exert gravitational forces on each other. For example, there is an object that is very large, close to you, 
called the Earth, that exerts a very large gravitational force on you. The symbol for this kind of mass, we may give it M with the subscript G, and just like inertial mass, it's measured in kilograms. And one of the things we want to do is determine what the relationship between those two kind of masses are. The third property that all objects have, excuse me, most objects have, is electric charge. This is the property that causes objects to exert electrical forces on each other. So we're going to see that gravitational forces and electric forces have a lot of similarities between them. We would measure this property in a unit called Coulombs, named after a Frenchman named Charles Coulomb, um, and you could give that unit the symbol C. In equations, we would give electric charge the symbol Q, and you can use either a capital Q or a lowercase q. And then finally, the fourth important property we need to review is that called density. Remember from chemistry that density is simply mass divided by volume. In physics, because we want to keep everything in terms of kilograms and meters, we're going to measure density in a unit called kilogram per cubic meter. The symbol for density is the Greek letter rho, and we can write a simple equation like density equals mass over volume. So those four properties, um, along with a few others we'll learn about later on, um, define how objects interact with each other and what they do when they interact with each other. Speaking of interactions, the way that objects interact with each other is via forces. You can kind of sort of think of a force simply being a push or a pull. So you cannot interact with an object unless you physically exert a force on that. In other words, we can't move things just with our minds. We actually have to push them in order to make them move. I know what you're thinking. Guess you're not Jedi's yet. The big idea is that forces can cause changes in an object's motion. And we're going to devote um, most of the time here at the beginning of the year to understanding how forces change objects' motion and what the specific rules for those forces are. The next thing we need to kind of discuss is the idea of a system. A system is a collection of objects, so collection meaning like two or more, that interact with each other. And again, remember, objects interact via forces. The properties of a system are determined by the properties of the objects. So for example, the mass of a system is just the sum of the masses of, an ob of all the objects within the system, and sometimes their arrangement. We're going to kind of see specific examples of that real soon. The choices of what objects make up a system, in fancy terms we may say comprise a system, belong solely to the observer. And by observer, typically we mean you. If you are careful in the way that you define a system, it will make your life a whole lot easier because we can use specific rules to understand what happens in a system. And so if we can determine what system would best match what rules, we can make our lives a little bit easier. Specifically, these rules are referred to as conservation laws. When we say conservation, that just means that something doesn't change. And so if we can apply these conservation laws we're going to learn later on, they'll make understanding systems a lot easier. You already know one conservation law from chemistry that of conservation of mass. So here are some examples of some systems we're going to study this year. Things like the motion of the planets, the motion of somebody shot out of a cannon, we're going to call that a projectile later on, um, what happens during a collision, and when we think of collisions we think of like cars colliding, but you walking is an example of a collision, hitting a baseball would be an example of a collision, and so there's a lot more to that than just cars running into each other. And then towards the end of the year, we'll get into electrical systems. And we'll learn how circuits work. We'll understand how switches and light bulbs and all that kind of stuff works. And what exactly is going on in a battery. So you have a lot to look forward to this year. I kind of hope you're excited. Um, I kind of hope we can remember these four basic properties for next time. 
Until then, ta-ta.